Welcome to Brookline Hub in Depth. I'm your host, Harvey Brothman. We're going to have a great um, hour for you. Uh, we have Rob Kerwin, who is the uh, producer, uh, co producer of Soul Witness, the Brookline Holocaust Witness Project, as well as Facing Civil Rights. Uh, I'm the other co producer on those films. And uh, Rob is a, an accomplished uh, producer, editor, director, uh, has done a lot of uh, documentaries for um, PBS, including Frontline and uh, Nova. Uh, we're really happy to have him. Uh, welcome to the show, Rob. Thank you, Harvey. It's great to be here. Rob is also, um, Rob and I have been friends for close to 30 years now, uh, longer than either one of us cares to admit. Uh, Partly the reason for all the gray. That's right. That's right. And my uh, my toupee. Um, I'm, I'm not wearing a toupee. And anyway, back in the 1980s, Leon Satinstein and Regina Barshak, two Brookline residents, um, were uh, chair people for a, a commission and had been set up in the town to find a way to properly recognize the Holocaust. There were several surviving Holocaust survivors in Brookline at that time. And Leon and Regina convinced their community to create a living memorial based on Holocaust testimonies that were uh, recorded on video. They were able to work with the Fortunoff um, video archives for Holocaust testimonies at Yale University, uh, Facing History in Ourselves, the Town of Brookline, and uh, an incredible individual named Lawrence Langer, who is considered by many the world's foremost authority in Holocaust testimonies. In fact, the testimonies that made up the film Soul Witness uh, represent Larry Langer's uh, first video interviews. Anyway, over a six year period, um, working as a team with Langer doing the interviewing, um, this group, interviewed 39 um, people, 36 survivors, and three liberators. Uh, liberators were considered uh, US servicemen who saw the liberation of uh, concentration camps. They interviewed, um, they conducted close to 90 hours of interviews. The interviews range from 45 minutes to seven hours. It was one of the greatest listening projects, I think, that our community has ever seen, and maybe any other local community. So for some unknown reason, um, these 90 hours of testimonies ended up in a closet for about 20 years. And uh, working with the town of Brookline, I was able to help recover them and restore them and worked with Rob Kerwin and the rest of our team to produce a film based solely on those testimonies. So Rob, I hope I got that right. Um, I've been given that, um, that elevator. Um, right hope it's down. a tall building. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it was a good a good summation of uh, the history behind the the filmmakers. Rob, before we get into the film, tell us tell us about a little bit about your career, um, how it started, and how you got to the point where you are now. Well, uh, I'm from Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, so not far away from Brookline. And, um, you know, if I go all the way back to the roots of why I got into the business, I think it was, um, I can trace it back to, in Cambridge at that time in the 1980s, 
dance parties were kind of everything. And um, it was very multicultural and everyone would gather at house parties. And I was a bit shy, but I found that if I could um, bring a mixtape and put on a tape, I could get people dancing, then I would feel comfortable. I'd start dancing and, and it was a good way to get into the flow of the party. Um, so what I found myself doing in preparation for these parties would be in my room with a couple of boom boxes kind of facing each other and queuing up a song that I liked on one tape deck and then hitting pause and record um, and rolling on the record side, the mixtape. And while I was doing that, I was kind of envisioning how people would react to what song should I start with? Should I change to a different song? Should I control the mood? Should it be a fast song or a slow song? And um, so I was kind of envisioning what the audience would be reacting to and what my hopes were for their reactions. And then when I went to a party, put the tape on and actually saw people react the way I wanted to. It was a kind of a thrilling moment. And um, so later when I discovered video and went to Emerson College, I found myself at the editing board, which was more sophisticated than my little boombox set up at home. But I found myself doing the same thing, queuing up a shot or a sound and then uh, laying down a sequence on a record tape. And while I was doing it, I was envisioning what the audience would be doing or reacting or thinking. And, um, and when that worked again, it was thrilling. And I kind of knew at that point that I was, there was something about that process that excited me. And um, I just kept following it and graduated from Emerson in 88 got a job at a local startup company that was making copies of tapes and doing um, basic video work and that company started growing and they actually purchased an avid uh, editing machine at one point and um, nonlinear computer-based editing and they put me in a room and they said rob you should learn this uh, i think it's going to be valuable for our company and i went in there and i started banging away on the boards and Within a day or two, I knew that this was going to be my career. Uh, I loved it. I was good at it, and um, it just went to my went back to my roots. So fast forward thirty years almost now. I think it's been twenty seven or twenty eight years since I first started working on a nonlinear system. Um, started with small gigs, corporate gigs, uh, nonprofit, educational, and then in about 96 or 97 landed my first broadcast television documentary job at a company called Pinball Productions. And they were working for a cable company, Discovery Channel in the early days. And um, from there, I just kind of one thing led to another and my skills got honed and I got better and better at the craft of editing. And then became affiliated with another company called Powderhouse Productions, which was also growing at the time during the cable boom and um, kind of worked my, my way up from editor to producer to senior producer, executive producer, helped um, run a whole department of production and post and became more familiar with the business side and uh, of television and also staffing and production. And, um, and then over the last say six or seven years, I've gone independent and worked for a number of clients. And depending on the size of the project, I could be anything from executive producer, director, editor, or all of the above. Um, so that's kind of a brief history of how I got here and how I got to work on the fabulous film, Soul Witness. Back in those early days, that company that purchased their first ad, but that's when we started working together. And I was actually a, a, a sales director for that company and um, New Avenue Communications, right? Correct. And we um, we traveled together and uh, 
I would spend time with you in the editing room so I wouldn't be out chasing my tail around um, at the end of the day. Um, but I think that's when I started really thinking about video myself and start telling my own stories. And first it was through writing and writing articles for, for a magazine. And then when, um, when these tapes, these 90 hours of tapes that had been in this closet landed on my conscience. I think that uh, you were the first person I thought of. And um, you're an incredible editor. And uh, for, for those that are out there, like if you see Rob Kerwin on a PBS show, watch it. It's going to be really good. But um, I think that um, it was really you know, I was thinking more in terms of your listening ability and your humanity and that this would take both and strength of character. Um, this, this was going to take more than film skills um, to do. And, um, and you were also working with a first time director. Uh, so I thought knowing me would be <laughs> an advantage for you. Um, what, do you remember first hearing about this and, and how you heard about it? And uh, I just remember you coming over to the powder house office where I was working at the time on a project and you told me about these tapes in a closet and that immediately sparked my interest. Then you told me what was on the tapes and and the fact that no one had really seen those for a couple of decades at least and that um, somebody had gone through the painstaking care to record these testimonies of holocaust first uh, first person witness accounts that sounded like a treasure trove of amazing emotional stories it i've been working a lot in the business for you know 27 years now and it's not that often you come across very powerful emotional material um so when i heard about these tapes and i started imagining what was on them um i realize that it may be an incredible opportunity to tell amazing emotionally impactful stories and that really got me excited and also working with harvey working with you harvey was um, something i really looked forward to and i knew that you would approach the material first and foremost from a human side um, a humanistic um, perspective so uh, i was very sure that you were going to approach it from a, you know, a very healthy standpoint or a, anyway, I, you know, I was kind of a little daunted at the number of hours. I think you had mentioned 90 hours. And uh, I was, uh, I was thinking, well, I'm not going to be able to look through that. That that's going to take up too much time, and will probably be too expensive um, for me to go through all that material. So I was kind of happy that you were going to be the one that had to go through every inch of those tapes and select out the strongest material that made the most sense that we could put together. I think at that time. You know, when I was going through the tapes, um, I often refer to it as living in the tapes because they never escaped me. It was, it was a good 12, 14 hours a day. I just, there was a very limited window of time because uh, my wife and I borrowed the money from ourselves and 
no other revenue was coming in. So I had that sort of pressure um, and um, I had to save as much money to pay for all the people working on the project. Um, but also more than that, um, I couldn't get the testimonies out of my head. I was, they were running in my head. They were running in my sleep. They were right wherever I was, um, they were there, the voices were there. And um, when you started working on it, uh, we would go on walks and talk about it endlessly, you know? So we were walking and talking when we weren't in the editing studio. Um, and that was pre-print pandemic when the producer and the uh, uh, editor was at, were actually in the same room. <laughs> Um, right. um, yeah, I remember those walks along the river in Watertown and you would be describing these people and their stories and I was just imagining uh, listening to you and starting to imagine um, what they looked like and how they sounded and what the what the visuals looked like how, how it was shot and it was it was very compelling the way you were telling me these stories and I knew it had an, an incredible and emotional toll on you. So I was kind of um, helping you to process some of that and, and take that emotion and start to think strategically about it and how we would present it. And the challenges of taking 90 hours and making it into a feature of, you know, 70 or 80 minutes. Um, so I, I was approaching it from a strategic standpoint and, and a storytelling standpoint. And I think maybe that was helpful to you. Uh, we talked a lot about the narrative arc. Right. And, uh, and that not only helped me with that project, but every project since. Um, and to, to keep, it's not just understanding the narrative art, how do you put it on screen? And uh, one of the things that, that I remember you teaching me that I, I still always think about, and I think I've taught other people, that's, that's when, you, when you really teach a lesson, when that person is teaching other people. And that's um, when is an audience ready to hear something? It's not just, is it good? And is it good for the audience? But when is it good for the audience? When is the audience ready for it? And giving them the information or an emotional hit when they're not ready for it doesn't do you any good and doesn't do the content any good. So that was to those, oh, I always kept thinking to myself, is the audience ready? Is the audience ready? I had you for that project, but every project since your voice is still in my head asking that question. Well, it goes back to me in my bedroom in high school. You know, what is the audience? What do I want the audience to feel? What do I want them to know? And in what order do I want them to know it? And always staying in the mind of your audience or your viewer. As a producer, as a writer, as an editor, I think that is a very healthy and good place to live when you're in the craft of filmmaking. But you're absolutely right. Holding back information and, and or emotional content until the audience needs to know it or is ready for it is a very, um, it's a classic rule of storytelling that we try to follow. One of the things that you helped me with that um, another thing that was huge, um, you did so much that's on the screen and that we could talk about and we should, but um, since we're, we're doing this, um, it, you provided a safe environment where I could think solely about the film and solely about the people who gave their testimony and always thinking about the people who did the, who 
did the interviews. They're part of the process. There was just a 30 year gap between their work and our work. But um, the town of Brookline had formed the commission. Um, they understood the pressure of all of this on, I guess, them. And uh, I was feeling the pressure and uh, was that on top of it was the first film and in my spare time, you know, which was just writing emails uh, while you were editing something, I was trying to raise the money for it and uh, rented a movie theater to uh, sell tickets uh, and then also try to get press for it. And all of these things happening at the same time. And um, to do all of that without, you made it possible for me to leave all of the other stuff at the door when it was time to work on the film because, and the survivors, because once you're in their world, nobody else's world seems to matter so much. That's right. Yeah. And in addition to keeping the audience's uh, perspective in your mind, you also want to pay tribute to the people that went through that effort of capturing these interviews, as you said, but most importantly, the people who were sharing their traumatic and very personal stories of their family's history and the tragedies around them um, and making sure that we preserved their personalities and their truth and their story as close as possible while of course having to dramatically compress it into a short version of their story right uh, or, or just one aspect of their story so but in making those choices, we really were mindful and you were um, guiding me through that process as well as to how to, because you had seen the totality of the interview and I was seeing your select versions. So you were helping to fill me in on the other details of their personality, their story that we wanted to preserve. So it was a very um, collaborative process to portray these people as accurately as possible. I remember you asking me in our first session of what, how I chose the footage. I was working with Danielle Myers, who was a, the assistant editor in that project and still is a big part of the Soul Witness project. But we had put together these little vignettes for you to look at so that I had the film down to about three hours from 90. And you asked, how did I choose the footage? And I said, well, I, I decided on two sets of criteria. And I think that when you went you heard the word criteria, you tell them, well, we're off to a good start that <laughs> if there's actually a plan for how you chose the, the footage and it wasn't just haphazard. And, and for the audience, it, the, the criteria was first person. It had to be something that that person um, saw with their own eyes. Even if their parent had seen it 10 minutes ago and was retelling the story, that doesn't count because I didn't want anyone to question, if they were gonna question one of these witnesses, they were gonna to have to question what they saw with their own eyes. And also, um, why in my, why I felt they came to the interview? What was the part of the interview? Right. People agreed to be interviewed um out of politeness or they just want to be interviewed uh, in this case that wasn't the case these people really didn't want to be interviewed they felt they had a they needed to do it um i think for our benefit but 
but also there was a main reason why they they agreed to it. And you, when they told that part, it was either a story that it had happened that they had been reliving in their head for 45 years before someone would listen to them, or it was about their family. And most often it was about their family, but you could tell their, their the, I, I felt their face changed pigmentation, I think, and their speech pattern changed and um, the way they sat in their seat changed and it, it, everything you could just tell this, this was a, this story was different than everything else that they said in the interview. And so if we're gonna be, you know, vessels for them, then I, w I, w I, w I was doing my best to pick something that I thought if they were making the choice and they only had three minutes, what would they want us to know in those three minutes? Yep, that's right. Um, these were some of the most amazing things that I've ever heard said. Are, are there any parts of the Anything that you recall that just always stayed with you from the film or from from the film? From yeah, well, work? absolutely. Moments that came to mind were uh, the pitchfork into the haystack where a mother was hiding her child from a group of soldiers that was searching a farm. And the pitchfork went into the haystack that they were hiding in and actually struck the mother's leg, but she remained silent. And the soldiers moved on and they escaped. That was like one of the most incredible, scary, powerful, brave. I mean, just any incredible word you could come up with that covered it. Uh, another moment was um, surviving in a, a hole for six months, eating nothing but roots and, you know, leaves and stuff. It was 19 months. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, imagine <laughs> six months, imagine 19 months. Um, and then the part where a, a young woman had to watch her brother throw a piece of bread over a fence to the, her mother because the brother realized he didn't need to eat it because he was about to die. And a seven-year-old boy had to turn around and walk away from his family. And the family knowing very well that that was the last time they'd ever see him that was chilling and heartbreaking. So those are a couple of things or two or three things that just popped into my mind. When you're saying that, I, I, um, I remember one thing that I still can't get over and it, it, it's seemingly small, but to me, it's sort of epic in proportion. Um, uh, a survivor when asked, um, why he thought he survived. And, and of course he didn't know. Whatever you did to survive increased your chances from like a million to one to half a million to one. But he said that um, his mother was in a different camp and he thought that if he died and his mother survived it would cause her great pain so he wanted to live so that he wouldn't cause her this great pain and i don't think i've ever heard an act of love for someone's mother that even approaches that i mean if you can imagine he's obviously starving to death he the 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 things that he's seeing that we can't see, we can't imagine them. Um, there's no video of things that I know of as they're happening. They're all the aftermath. 
and um, that he, even in his mind that that to to want to live so that you don't cause someone else pain. I've never heard anything described that way before. I, I remember sitting at the editing suite and, you know, trimming up the words and making sure the edits were smooth and natural and crying, you know, wiping away my tears. Even watching these moments over and over again, you think you would get numb to them, but they were so powerful that I was tearing up and feeling, you know, incredibly emotionally moved, but also so grateful to have the opportunity to tell these stories and to work on a project that had such meaning about the human condition. I was so thankful. They were tears of sadness, uh, and but also tears of appreciation at the same time. It was, it was quite, quite an experience to edit this stuff. When, when we um, showed the, the rough cut for the first time, which has all of, you know, not a lot was added after the rough cut in terms of new footage. And um, we're sitting in that theater. So we, we had sold tickets for $25 each for a first time director rough cut. And there were 432 seats, which is pretty big for a movie theater. And especially now, and um, it, it had it sold out. It was on the globe and people were talking about it and no one had seen it, but us. And I kept thinking, wow, like it's even then knowing, you, you know what we had because you had a lot more experience with it than I did. But I live, eat, drink movies ever since I was a little kid. Um, and so that to produce a movie that was on a screen, we had done the youth awards and just the fact that it was in a movie theater and we were just showing interviews of teenagers, that was a big deal <laughs> to actually have a movie. But I knew that the people in that theater were about to get hit with something that they couldn't even, there was nothing that they could imagine that would approach what they heard because of the sharing. The, the, these, they weren't just say, I, these witnesses or these survivors weren't just saying, I saw this and something about a gas chamber or something. It was what was in their souls that they were sharing. Absolutely. And one of the things we realized early on is that this entire film is going to be just talking heads. There were, we weren't going to use, obviously there was no footage of this. We could have reached into the archive and tried to illustrate some of the, the context, but we realized that this was just going to be very, very personal. And if we did try to approximate the story or visualize the story, it would not be as authentic and real and it would that would put our own spin on things and we didn't want to do that even though we knew it was a challenge that people would just be listening and watching people talk for uh, 60 plus minutes what was the final um length 72 or 63 63 minutes um so we knew it was a challenge that people were going to have to the only thing they could see are people talking for 63 minutes. We did come up with some techniques to break it up with text to add context, but um, and, and music breaks, which 
just to give the audience a chance to breathe and, and to sure. pace it out. We couldn't figure out um, like how, how, how to deal with order. Um, and I, and we finally decided on a, um, semi chronological order before the war hostilities build because before the war is a different year in Hungary than it was in Germany or Poland. So, but still there, that what's happening is still the same. There is no war. So they're telling you what the what it was like when they were happy and um and then as things start to change and and i think more importantly even what they what it was like at liberation and what it was like 45 years after liberation that it hadn't left them yeah well i remember having a very clear discussion <clears throat> that we needed to find every bit of life before this happened uh, and, and really treat that as gold because that was portraying what they had and the specialness of their lives at the time and their culture and that what they lost um, and it really helped the emotional arc starting high, then dipping down and then some resolution or, or not. Um, but we really made an effort to find, and it was not necessarily that easy to find more positive moments in their testimony. Um, but you managed to pull out some real key little bits that we used to portray their lives before. I did an interview with um, WBUR in not long before the pandemic uh, in late 2019. And, you know, we had a bunch of screenings booked for this that the pandemic, you can't complain about what the pandemic took away if you're healthy right now and your family's healthy. So that all, and, and your work team is healthy. So we have all of that, but I rem I think it took me two full years after we finished before I really understood what had happened. When we were showing that rough cut, I was pretty, I wasn't broken, but I was in a, I was in a million pieces. <laughs> I was together somehow but um i there's a just trauma that goes into dedicating a year to your life of your life to just listening to survivors but i found from it um now it took me two full years when i before i realized what a gift that was what a gift to listen to those people when you hear you, no one wanted to listen to them. And we know that you and I, we did listen to them over and over and we're in that select group. And we interviewed Lawrence Langer together. And when we did it, you shot it and I interviewed and you interviewed too. And I was so nervous. I prepared for days for that interview. And then when he came he, he was so excited to see us. And this is a guy that gets in arguments with everyone <laughs> because he's so intense. And, um, but he saw us as sort of, we had been there. We had been to a place that he spent his life in and he knew that he could talk and we would listen from a standpoint of experience and when we show this to students now, we talk about listening. We talk about when a friend comes to you when they're really in pain and you devote the next 15 minutes to listening to them instead of having your mind like living in your own head. Uh, and, um, and just to share that to when you know 
that you've been listened to, if it's a parent or whatever it is, when you know you've been listened to, what a gift that is. And so we always say to the audience now, the only thing you have to do for the next hour is listen. Yep. That's great. And it'll be hard, but you don't have to go through the Holocaust. You just have to go through the next hour. That's right. I remember one of the challenges we had was we wanted to represent as many of the survivors as we could, uh, but we we didn't want to give up going deep on specific individuals so that we could get the real details of their story that would be impactful. So that was a bit of a creative challenge that we had. And I remember one night in the edit suite, we took a break because we were getting a little frustrated um, on how to handle that. And we were talking, I think we had dinner and um, we came up with this concept of having a medley of sound bites that could set the mood or the context or mark the time. And that way we could use the larger chorus of people to help us set the time and place and the stakes and then dip into a very personal story uh, where the details would be very impactful. And once we figured that technique out or that structure, it really started to unlock the material for us. At the beginning of the film, you use this compression technique. Um, that's the only way I know how to describe it. But at first, you, I remember you having this idea that at the beginning, we'll try to get sound bites like before the recording started. Is this my gone? Is this like just some sort of... And um, we couldn't find anything that was really fitting that. And I remember um, one survivor, during the entire interview, she had this yellow um, legal size piece of paper like that she was holding on to uh, the whole time and um, or was right next to her or something like that. And she was the woman who lived in the Ukrainian forest in the hole for 19 months. And um, she had been waiting to the end of this four hour interview to list the people who had her family members who experienced the Holocaust. And she read the list for five straight minutes. Try to read off names for five straight minutes. You come up with a lot of names. And um, it was so long that it had this effect on you of just listening and over and over and over. And I remember getting emotional the first time I heard it. And I thought, oh, she's gonna read the whole list. And I, I wasn't thinking of how Paul, the effect it would have on me, but it had this profound effect. And then you came up with the idea of like, I, I remember telling you, I wish I could do something with this. So then you went back to your idea of like having all of the little sound bites and you, pressed all of that so that that her voice was overlapping um and, and that's the trailer for the film and yeah i uh <clears throat> i remember that and thinking your instinct was so good but we can't just let her talk for five minutes at the beginning or any any part of the film uh, just listing people's names. So how can we create that effect, but shortcut the, the amount of time, screen time it took? So that was like an editing challenge. So what we came up with was that we would layer her voice on top of each other, and it would kind of descend into a, a cacophony or a, a um, 
a chorus of her own voice listing these people's names and then we would kind of descend into that and then come out of it at the end and um i think it was pretty effective i think it worked some people i remember reacted they there was something wrong with the sound sure or something like that uh, i don't think it was a perfect uh, execution but i think most people got it and got the intention of it and found it to be um, an, an effective or powerful way to present it. The first idea for that, actually, I don't think I've ever even told you about it, but um, while you and I were working on the actual film and, and Danielle worked on the film as well, um, but she and I were creating the, the credits, which went on forever because there's six years of shoots, there's 39 shoots, and they all had crews. And so we had to find all the crew names and everything, and it just went on. And I was thinking that she would read this list during that. And I um, sort of tried to play it, you know, because the, we had no sound yet for the credit roll. And I, you couldn't take it. It was because of the way we had structured the film, you were in a way had come back to the present. We had, you know, what you taught me, when is the audience ready? And I thought, well, this is a great visual thing. It works on all fronts except for one, the audience, it's past when the audience can handle it. It something needs to breathe now. And instead, Ed Granga uh, wrote us some music that would allow the and and uh, and his partner Douglas Stevens to allow us to start breathing again. Yeah, and that that music was so perfect. It was so powerful and moving and elegant and respectful i don't know how he he does it but he channeled the film in a perfect way yeah i don't think we uh, forget i forget but i don't think we changed a note no we in fact we um we were using you were working on another holocaust project holocaust escape tunnel for nova and um, we, we used their open as a fill-in. So Temporary uh, hold, placeholder. Placeholder so that we could think of something. Yeah, that's right. And we sort of really liked it. And it was totally different than what we used. Yep. And then that one, of the best, one of the best professional parts of it is everyone, you know, Ed and Douglas are working for like peanuts for us because there was hardly any budget left when it came to the music. And when the edit, when the producers for Holocaust Escape Tunnel heard our new music, they liked it so much that they hired Ed and Douglas. So Ed and Perfect. Douglas got a payday that was uh, commensurate with their skill and Fantastic. talent level. So I also uh, just a shout out to uh, Douglas. The sound quality of the interviews was wide ranging. Some of the interviews were very low um, audio level. Some were over modulated. Some were crackling and popping. And, um, you know, sometimes the mic had slipped into a bad position and um, we knew that a key for people to emotionally connect to these people telling the story was that they could understand every word. We didn't want to subtitle it unless it was in another language. We wanted to make sure that the focus of the viewer was on the face of the person so they could really read the emotions. And um, Douglas amazingly was able to kind of normalize and uh, bring back and restore to a 
a very good quality, each individual sound, interview sound track. And that made a huge difference in the presentation. Yeah, you know, I try not to make too much of that, but it's so important that the, because the, the people working, they were either volunteers or it was their first job at an access station. And here they, I mean, the responsibility, they didn't even know how, what they would, you know, how important this really was, what they were doing, because I don't think the community even at that time knew how important it was, except for a few people. But they, you know, they were doing the best they could, but they these were done over six years. And every time they, I think they set the audio level differently on every single tape. So it wasn't made like, it, they weren't thinking they were producing our film. They right. thought they were just doing their, what should we, what should we set it for today, you know? And uh, I remember at the end, um, and uh, I, uh, uh, the survivor says, um, I live with it. And it was something I really wanted um, her to say, to hear. But when she said, I live with it, she puts her, she slaps her chest, which is where the mic is. So it's, I, you know, I hit it, hit it with it. And I'm like, it's too bad that happened. I want to use it. And um, I, I don't know how many hours Douglas spent to tr try to find I somewhere that she said in the testimony that would work perfectly. And then it took him forever to get that. He substituted I somewhere else for when she had hit the, I mean, to do something like that when uh, you're being underpaid and you've agreed to do something, I think people like us, we're only going to do that if the for the content. He wasn't right. doing it for me. He was doing it for her. He was doing it for the survivor on the screen. And Rob, thanks so much for taking the time. I love you. I, we went through this and um, if uh, I always say, if I never do anything else, I know I did this and to do it with you when it couldn't have been done with anyone else in my mind. Um, so uh, you, you're, if, if I would have built a pedestal, I'd put you on it. So <laughs> thank oh. you. You're very welcome. This was definitely a, a memorable film for me. Um, it really was the first time I saw a packed theater with a huge screen with a film that I had edited. Most of my stuff ends up on television. I had done a couple of film festival things, but nothing with that kind of packed house and um, the emotional impact that it had. Um, that was unique for me as well. So um, you put me in that position. I'm very appreciative of that. Uh, also, uh, you had to endure the real pain of going through the 90 hours of testimony to find the best bits. And I know it took an emotional toll on you. And, um, and you know, I was part of the therapy maybe to, to help you process that stuff on our walks and in the edit suite. Uh, but I was, I was, um, so grateful to have that material um, pre-selected down to uh, um, an amount that my brain could handle and I could stay enough distant from it that I could help make some of the hard choices of arranging the, the stories, trimming the stories. So, you know, from my perspective, it was an experience that I'll never forget and I'm grateful for it. And just to be part of telling those stories and having other people react to those stories that were locked in a closet for two decades. Um, that was so satisfying and uh, thanks. Thanks Rob, we're friends for life. All right, absolutely. We'll talk soon. Hi, 
My name is Danielle Myers of ADW Video Productions and BrooklineHub.com. BrooklineHub.com is a 501c3 nonprofit online publication dedicated to community building through local reporting and events. Brookline Facing Civil Rights was produced by our founder, Harvey Brofman. The film is about the experiences of African Americans who helped break the wall of segregation that existed in Brookline before the civil rights laws were passed in the 1960s. Last year, the film sold out the Coolidge Corner Theater and included a panel discussion on inclusivity. You can stream the film and the discussion on brooklinehub.com in exchange for a donation to the Brookline Community Foundation's Safety Net Fund. You can also stream Soul Witness, a film that features interviews with Brookline Holocaust survivors conducted 30 years ago, on soulwitness.org. For the last 11 years, Harvey has been interviewing outstanding teens as part of an event held at the Coolidge called the Brookline Youth Awards. The Brookline Youth Awards are an opportunity for Brookline residents to hear about the character, challenges, and dreams of its young people, as well as adults dedicated to their success through the power and intimacy of video interviews. Mm -hmm.